to, I think I will give the floor first to uh, Abarad. Yes, I'm starting. Thank and, you. And uh, you have uh, some time for, for uh, to explain. You have nine minutes. Well, I'll, I'll uh, try to keep it short, my part, as some of the things have already been mentioned by previous speakers. Um, yeah, we have been commissioned by CNB to conduct a study on uh, risks in mining supply chains. We're looking at uh, coal from Colombia, as well as several of the minerals that are important in the energy transition that uh, come from Peru and Bolivia. Uh, we're looking at main actors, at especially the EU supply chain and the involvement of um, European financial institutions in financing these, um, these actors. We're looking at the impact of human rights due diligence policies and practices on labor rights and at market trends more broadly that are linked to the energy transition. This uh, whole study is still work in progress, but yeah, we'll briefly presenting some uh, first outcomes. Um, I'll be very quick on this. This has been mentioned uh, before, but um, the energy transition is obviously connected to a shift in uh, the sourcing of um, commodities. Um, we're seeing a shift away from coal, for example, um, towards other, um, other types of energy supplies. But there are obviously a lot of uh, geopol geopolitical influences uh, looking just at, at the current shift away from coal in Russia towards more imports from Colombia again at the moment, as well as technological shifts that are pretty unpredictable in many ways, how they will influence the, the future demand for minerals. There are various scenarios that are being made. Um, which all point to a very significant increase in demand for um, several of these minerals, as um, can be seen here, looking at transport, uh, especially the move towards electrical cars, as well as power generation, where the, the resource need is much, much higher than it is for conventional fossil fuels. Um, yeah, this is a... Um, this shows two scenarios. I think it's very telling. The steps scenario that the, the IEA is, um, is quoting is a very um, low level scenario that will not allow to reach the Paris Agreement and still requires a very significant um, about a doubling in uh, mineral demand. And a more ambitious uh, scenario, the SDS, which would almost allowed to reach the Paris um, uh, commitments will mean that there's a uh, quadrupling in demand for minerals with all the consequences that are attached to it. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, the, the trajectories for this demand are um, subject to large technological and as well as policy uncertainties. Uh, there will be innovation for sure, as there has been in the past which may reduce or increase the demand for certain minerals. There will likely be increased uh, recycling capacities and capabilities, but the expectation at the moment is not that this will eliminate the need for new supplies to be, um, to be included. And um, well, as was discussed already, mining and processing of minerals um, comes with uh, links to countries that um, have weaker um, labor and environmental protections uh, and all the risks connected to that. So the, the supply chains that we are looking at are copper, lead, molybdenum, silver, tin and zinc from uh, Peru and Bolivia. Uh, both countries play, especially Peru, Bolivia to a lesser degree, play an important role in mine production as well as in holding very important reserves and being uh, among the top exporters of these minerals, which are playing crucial roles in solar, wind, as well as electric vehicle um, production. So um, yeah, what, we, what we're seeing is a, yes, a very important role for, for um, mining uh, output from these countries combined with a complete lack of transparency. Um, we try to, to make connections along the supply chain, which is obviously very complicated as we saw in previous um, presentations. 
but um, yeah, there is there is a a, a big lack in um, uh, detailed information that would allow to to trace the supply from certain um, production sites to to end products, which is um, yeah undoubtedly very challenging in multi tier commodity supply chains, but. At the same time, uh, we all know how important monitoring and transparency is um, in identifying and mitigating risks. And uh, when talking about risks, I would like to uh, hand over to my colleague Diana, who's going to talk about findings on uh, policies and labor rights. Yes, thank you, Barbara. Uh, let me go. Yes. So we were looking at the upstream, upstream segment of the, of the supply chain, where we will also look at the downstream segment, but I'm not gonna present this now. Um, and uh, well, we were looking at 10 companies that are active, as Barbara said, in Bolivia, Peru, and Colombia, and their um, parent companies uh, in, in other countries, such as Canada, Switzerland, Peru, Brazil, Singapore, and the USA. And we looked at their um, published uh, human rights policies, um, uh, and we compared these policies with their sustainability reports just to see if there was alignment between their stated intentions and their actions. And we also um, run these policies uh, against the six steps, uh, the OECD guidelines, basically, um, to see if indeed they were com uh, complying with this. So um, we found that two of the six parent companies that had published uh, a human rights policy. Um, and the, well, that it, there is a, it's, it's not a, a big number, uh, it's only two of them, uh, whereas all the other companies only have, uh, or only, they have a CSR policy that it's more generally speaking about, um, about their intentions, but not, none of them really states uh, how they're actually taking steps to prevent um, and, and, and mitigate uh, human right, uh, human right breaches, especially with regards to, to um, to labor rights uh, abuses. Um, we also uh, found that all companies provide a channel to file complaints, and this could suggest that there is a given mechanism, mechanism in place, uh, but none of the companies really provided information regarding how um, this, well, grievance uh, investigations take place and, and how especially remedies provided. And uh, we also didn't find any gr grievance list and any of the companies uh, we researched and uh, basically not, no detailed information whatsoever. Um, so yeah, this information, as I said, was not part of this HR policies, uh, this human rights policies and um, yeah, and did not align with their stated sustainability approach. The next please. And the next one, please. Um, so, uh, in terms of, uh, of the practices, well, the results we, are, we obtained so far are consistent with the results of the Business and Human Rights Research Center. Uh, in their, especially in regards to their Transition Minerals Tracker, where almost half of the companies that they researched in 2021 in Latin America had no policies in place. So it seems like this is a common um, industry practice. Uh, but if we take a closer look at the labor rights safeguards for the companies that we researched, the panorama is even more murky. Um, and indeed, the companies that address labor rights as part of their, of their policies mentioned emphasis on, on the core labor standards, but they didn't specify again how labor rights um, risks especially are identified, prevented, and mitigated. And also largely absent from these policies were the core labor, core labor issues, such as social dialogue and um, social protection. Um, also, there was no specification as regarding their, their, uh, their hiring practices. And this is especially uh, important in terms of, of hiring subcontractors, uh, because well, um, it, it, from a study that uh, was previously conducted uh, by CNB, uh, it seems like this is a particular problem, especially in Colombia and in, and in Peru. Um, you can go to the next piece. So we also looked at the financiers of this uh, uh, companies and we found that uh, between 2016 and 2021, there were almost $35 billion invested um, in, the, in the parent companies or in the local operations in these Latin American countries. Um, and well, amongst the investors and, and uh, our, um, our, yes, our companies, our banks and European banks and even Dutch uh, pension funds. Thank you. 
Thank you, Gianna. Can we um, stop here? You think it, I think the, in, uh, the research is very interesting because it shows on one side also what uh, what is happening in the transition to the, the, to the energy sourcing, um, what the response to it is in uh, theory, but we also have the practice. And I think that you, the last slide was on, on the financing and we haven't yet heard from you whether they take into consideration the policies and, and the practice on, on you know, human rights, due diligence. But I, I think that I would like only have a 30 second response, if one of you can respond, um, maybe Barbara, you can. How can government and companies and trade unions and NGOs prepare themselves to ensure that the risks that you have identified can be mitigated in our actions? You know, what do we have to do to ensure that it is included? Diana, do you want to respond? Uh, yes, certainly. Well, uh, as Barbara mentioned before, transparency is, is quite an issue. At least we have encountered that. And, and I think... Uh, Can you speak up a little bit, Diana? Because you, the voice is a bit low. Yes, uh, certainly improving transparency is, is a must. And so far, we, we, it's really hard to, to keep track of, um, of, yeah, of, of uh, what the, uh, companies are doing on the ground, but also how companies downstream are uh, taking into account human rights risks in their purchasing decisions. Um, and certainly this should be accompanied by, um, by policies that are more binding, uh, legal frameworks that are binding. It's very good that there are um, uh, voluntary uh, uh, well initiatives. Those are very good, but it's proven over again, not just in this sector, but in many other sectors that this okay. are insufficient. Let's keep it like that. I think it's very in the transparency 